Hello, and I hope everybody's having an awesome, awesome day today. When you share your life with a pet, it's, it's like living a fairy tale. To your dog, you're a heroic knight or a beautiful princess. Your dog or your cat doesn't care if you're the prettiest or the smartest. Your pet will listen to your problems. They never criticize you. And when you're having a not so great day, your faithful four-legged friend will just put his head in your lap look up at you with those loving brown eyes and it's like he's saying don't worry it'll be okay and you know what it will be okay cheering up humans is one of a dog's greatest tricks today is april 26th it's national kids and pets day so i want to talk to you a little bit about things you can share with the next generation of animal caregivers the younger the younger set because so many of you listening today um like me have had one two three maybe 10 or 20 or those of you that pets it maybe hundreds of amazing animals in your life and it's just so important that we, you know, pass that on, that pets are part of the family, that we never go back to, you know, the dog living out on a chain in the backyard, the cat roaming and, you know, trying to catch his food for a meal, but that we really, um, you know, instill in the younger generation that pets are part of the family and encourage that companionship. A lot of you have heard me talk before about Zuea. If you've taken a pet first aid class, or even if you remember back to your days of bi um, biology, you remember zoonosis or zoonotic diseases, diseases that transfer between species, things we can get from animals. And obviously rabies is one of the first ones that come to mind. But ringworm and giardia, tick-borne diseases like Lyme disease, Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever, toxoplasmosis from cats, and so on. Well, a few years back, a new, I guess, Webster's Dictionary or, or, you know, whoever's doing it these days coined a new word, and it's not zoonosis, but it's the inverse, zoea. And what zoea means is it's actually scientific proof that animals improve our health. Not that they give us a disease, but they actually improve our health. They make us get our butts up off the couch to walk the dog. Um, a lot of people have quit smoking because we've learned that secondhand smoke is equally bad for dogs and cats as it is for other humans. Um, people that are elderly or shed in for some reason actually get out and meet people because they have to get out and walk the dog. Um, there's all kinds of studies that have been done about animals lowering blood pressure, you know, release, um, calming us down. What they actually do is they release the happy hormones in our body. By petting or hugging our dogs, we um, release oxytocin and um, endorphins, and we minimize cortisol, which is the stress hormone. So pets do amazing things, and we found that, you know, by living with a pet, you often build up your immune system, and that children that actually bond with a dog or a cat grow up to be more empathetic or sympathetic as well, human beings. So it's so important that we, you know, encourage this companionship and this love for animals um, with the younger kids, and that we practice a few rules that we share with them so that animals aren't set up for disaster because that's what often happens. So, you know, when a, when a younger child meets a dog, one of the first things I always tell them to do is to stand like a tree, stand still, not stiff and nervous, but stand still and let the animal come to them. Then put out your hand, generally um, the, the, the top, the back of your hand up. Some people keep it in a fist. But let the pet sniff and then slowly go up under the chin and around, you know, the back here up to the ears. It's so important that kids don't pat dogs on the head. Um, it looks like a slap and it's very scary to one of our, you know, canine friends. And it's not surprising that they might bite or nip or something, you know, along those lines. Um, I also feel no matter what age we are, it's important we talk to the dog or the cat as we're doing something. Um, those of us that are older and maybe giving medication or taking the temperature, doing any kind of first aid technique. Um, an animal trainer friend of mine, Jen Freelich, if she's out there, um, was one of the people that really introduced this to me and she's just amazing what she has done with her Rottweilers and Pitties and other dogs over the years. But it's just kind of talking them through. 
Um, a lot of, you know, there are some amazing dogs. They say Border Collies are the smartest. Um, whether they are or not, I don't know, but there's um, one Border Collie that knows at least a thousand words, um, so it is said. I'm sure all of us think our pets pick up on a lot of the words we use. But if nothing else, you know, a lot of the thinking is that so many of us think, oh my gosh, the dog is at the door waiting for me when we get home. He knows I'm coming. And a lot of the, the studies that have been done is that we're actually sending mental pictures of us rounding the corner, you know, pulling up in the driveway, and that's the vibration that the pet's receiving. I don't know if we'll ever know all of this stuff for real or for not, but I think by talking to the pet, Number one, it keeps um, you calm. You're going through the procedure. He, your pet is um, noticing a calm demeanor. There's a calmness to your voice. And you're just sharing and relating to the animal. So I think that's always a good thing. So, you know, when a child meets a dog before even approaches, it's good to talk to the dog from a distance and say, I'd like to come over and pet you. I'm going to put my hand out and let you sniff me. I'd like to scratch behind your ears and so on. Um, so I think those are always good introductions and always, always teach kids to ask the adult as well if they can pet the animal um, before they begin to do so. We all know that, you know, sometimes things happen, kids can stumble, they can fall onto the dog, they can try to get up and actually pull the tail or grab at the ears. A lot of it's accidental, but there's just so many things we need to instill in them so that those mistakes aren't made. I've got a little pop-up here I want to get rid of so I can see who's all here joining me today. Hey, all of you guys, it's great to see you. Or have you seen me and I get to see your names? I'll have to figure this out one of these days so I can see you guys as well. But anyway, some other things with the kids. Um, if they see a stray or injured dog, to not, you know, go after it like, Pet Safety Crusader probably would have, even when she was too small, but to, um, you know, get an adult so that the animal can get the help he needs. Um, to provide their own pets with um, food and water, if there's ever anything that's not looking quite right with the pet, you know, to ask a parent to check it out and get them veterinary care. I think it's wonderful if the kids can go along to the veterinarian. It's, I know it's sometimes it's during school days, but so that they can go through the process and really be there for their best friend, like their best friend wants to be there for them. Um, they kids can go around the yard and if you have a fence they can you know be on patrol to make sure there are no holes that have been dug or any breaches in the fence so that their dog can't pull a Houdini act and that they're going to keep you know their pet safe. Also if they do see a stray dog to never like yell at it or throw their hands or make loud noises if the pet isn't threatening them because if they're just scaring a pet away it's very likely they can scare them into traffic and then that dog will be hit by a car. Always, you know, other reasons for doing that if a, if a child is feeling threatened and needs, you know, a pet to stay away. But it's just one of those things out of play or whatever when you try to scare a, a pet away and they dash. That's why one of the things I always say is that if you are um, walking your own dog, for instance, and we've talked about this, what you do if a, a stray dog approaches you, and some people say to have an air horn, some people to say have a can of rock, some people to say have an umbrella or something else, but whenever it is something that will startle an animal or make a loud noise, I just, number one, always say make sure you have a good grip on your pet so your pet won't be chased into the street, and, you know, just do take care to notice the environment so that as much as you don't want that stray animal to hurt you or your pet or your child that you don't you know cause it any undue harm. Um, having kids get into the process of learning to bathe and brush their pets is so important but the big thing here is supervise, supervise, supervise. Um, you don't ever use an animal as a babysitter. I know we've seen the R Gang movies, or I'm really dating myself on that. Um, we've all talked about you know how pit bulls um, sit by the prams in um, England because they're kind of like babysitters. But you just never want to set up a dog for disaster like that because anything can happen. A kid can let out a shriek that, you know, will sound like injured prey that it, a pet will go after or really hurt his ears. So all of these things I'm encouraging um, kids to do 
and learn about to be around their pets, we need adult supervision because anything can always happen. Um, help have the kids go um, research the pet food and help you shop for it. And you know, I'm going to tell you not to shop for the pretty label, but to you know, teach them about reading the ingredients that we're looking for the good, healthy stuff to go into Fido or Fluffy. Um, they can certainly help with doing the pet's dishes and learn how important it is to really wash out that water bowl as well as the food bowl because a biofilm, you know, from their tongues and bacteria actually forms on it. So you don't just dump it out and put more or just keep adding more water. You, you know, need to learn to scrub it every day. They can certainly learn to walk their dog on a leash as long as the dog isn't bigger or stronger than them at that point in time. But again, with adult supervision. Um, it's just so important because our, our dogs are like toddlers too and our kitty cats and they're not going to grow up like the human children who will. So it's important that, you know, we're always thinking of them as our, our furry children and making sure our two legged human children and them get along and have to really develop a really terrific relationship. Um, uh, equally important is teaching children to know the signs when the dog or cat wants to be left alone. Um, you know, not to take the, the pet's toy, not to bother him when he's sleeping or eating. Um, it's just so vital that we don't create a, a potential for an accident in doing so. And I know some of these things are tough to remind the kid, well, that's the dog's toy and that's the, the human's toy. But if we don't do those things, we're really, you know, looking for disasters. Yes, toddlers for life, and we are their guardians. Absolutely, Gail. And what a what a privilege it is for us to be their guardians. It really is. But is along with all the things we want kids to learn to do and respect the animals, there are also some things you know we want to teach them not to. And I know kids will be kids, and they're going to punch each other, and they're going to play mean tricks on each other. But animals, we just have to really teach them that respect is a whole different thing because animals. Um, or just unconditional love. And the only way an animal has to speak up is a growl or a bite or a hiss for the most part. So we have to make sure we never let it escalate to that point and that we don't throw things at a dog or we don't pull a cat's tail or a dog's ears, that we don't go too close to a dog who's chained or tied up, that we tell an adult about it so that that animal can get help and not be left in that predicament. But obviously, and, and there's a whole other video if you go back to the archives where I was talking about chained dogs a couple of months ago, um, you know, that tends to make um, pets more vicious because they're used to people just going to the end of their lead. And, um, you know, at some point in time, maybe that chain will even break and they'll be able to potentially bite somebody. But we want to get that pet help so that he won't stay chained up for periods of time, but we don't want to go close to him. Um, I already mentioned not disturbing a pet when he's eating or sleeping and never grabbing his toy and just, you know, never really screaming um, when a, a dog or a cat comes near. Not only is that hurtful to their ears, but it can set off the whole predator prey response. So it's just important to give kids a few what we may think are common sense rules, but um, really impress upon them the things we can do just to really show these wonderful creatures how important parts of our lives they are. In the same vein, though, we have to teach our dogs some manners. We have to get them obedience trained. We have to supervise them around the pets. We have to make sure that they have a space where they can get away from the noise and the ruckus at times. And we have to make sure we get those medical checkups at least once a year and possibly twice yearly when they get to be seniors. Because sometimes, whether it's a child or an adult, um, a dog is going to get grouchy or a cat's going to get, you know, in a, in a bad mood. And sometimes that's caused by a medical problem, often because they've got arthritis or their teeth are hurting or something just doesn't feel quite right. So don't think it's what's called late onset aggression. It very often is medically based and it's our responsibility to give them the care as well as the love they need. Um, and it's getting warmer in some places. We're having kind of a rainy day here. I don't know where you are, but just never, ever, ever like you wouldn't with a child, human child, never, ever, ever leave your dog or cat alone in a parked car. 
Now there's one other thing I'd like to um, talk about today, and that's hairballs, because although today is National Kids and Pets Day, tomorrow is National Hairball Awareness Day. Did you guys even know there was such a thing? Well, I just recently found out, and we know the best way to keep fur balls away is brush the kitty, brush the kitty, brush the kitty, because cats have these little hook-like structures on their tongue called papillae, which um, actually, you know, pull the hair, the loose hairs from their body when they groom and they swallow them. And most of them do pass through the digestive tract, but some remain in the stomach and actually form a ball. And we call them fur balls or hair balls. But by the time they come up and out, um, they're actually vomited up. I guess um, it really wouldn't be regurgitated. I, it could be because usually things that are regurgitated are still in the esophagus. And um, when a, a fur ball is a ball in the stomach, but then it has to pass through that narrow opening, which is the esophagus, that's why they become, you know, these long, narrow, kind of pretty much disgusting things that, especially when we get out of bed during the night and step on one, we're really grossed out. Um, there can be a lot of hacking and gagging and retching that goes on first. But if you ever are noticing that, you know, there is a lot of that and that the gagging and the hacking and the retching and the furball isn't coming up, um, if the cat's having vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy, uh, loss of appetite, difficulty breathing, anything that's not quite right, do have a veterinary visit. But, you know, very often cats will, you know, cough up a, a hairball and one of the best ways you can do it, um, do to try to alleviate, try to keep them going through the system. Number one, like I said, is brush the kitty, brush the kitty, brush the kitty. So you'll get more of that hair out and they won't digest it. But also you can feed high fiber foods. Um, there's, there are some pet foods on the market that actually say they have a hairball reduction formula. Um, the ones I've read for the most part do seem to just be higher fiber. I hope it's not really something that's dissolving the hairballs because we don't want to think about all those chemicals going in our pet. There are hairball formulas. Um, there are, they're, they're, they actually give cats laxatives sometimes to help pass through. But I imagine you guys can all come up with what my favorite remedy other than brushing the kitty is. And that's that pumpkin puree. A half a teaspoon of pumpkin a day keeps the fur balls away. So you can just, you know, see if your cat likes it. Most dogs and cats like the pumpkin, but every once in a while I'll come across one that just doesn't like it. But it's fibery and sweet, even without the cinnamon, the nutmeg, the condensed milk, the sugar, and all the things we put into a pumpkin pie. And it's fibery and it pushes things through. So um, give that a go if your cat is seeming to have problems with hairballs. And um, I hope you can keep her well and happy with a beautiful coat and a wonderful attitude for a long, long while. Um, yes, and I'm just looking at some of the com comments. Um, a dab of Vaseline. I actually haven't heard so much on the nose. I've heard people to put it on the palate, on the roof of the mouth, but I guess either way they ingest it. But I have to be honest with you. Um, I know sometimes vets will say that, but Vaseline is petroleum jelly, petroleum, you know, gasoline. Um, so I'd much rather um, put the pumpkin into the cat. I know that kind of does the trick. And a lot of us consume a lot of things that sound gross and we live to tell about it. I mean, what, what is the song out, you know, these days about my generation? So I'm going to pretend most of you are younger than me, although I know at least one of you is older than me, hint, hint. Um, but uh, something about, you know, we grew up in the generation that had lead paint on our cribs and we didn't wear helmets on our bikes and we drank out of the hose and here we still are doing our thing. Um, so, you know, a lot of us and a lot of animals eat things they shouldn't, but the more we can put good things into our bodies, I think the better off. <laughs> I guess you figured out, huh, sis? <laughs> anyway, um, but I hope I've given you a little food for thought today about any children you may be around or the children of clients or just anybody, you know, you may come across um, to, to give them a few, I don't want to say rules, but a few life lessons about really showing respect for our animal friends. And then, like I said, a half a teaspoon a day keeps the pumpkin away. You guys have an awesome weekend. I will see you on Monday at 11 a.m. And I'm going to talk a bit about um, pet parenting because Sunday is actually National Pet Parents Day. 
I don't think it's made the calendars or all the, the greeting cards like Mother's Day, Father's Day, and other days, but it's our holiday, everyone. So really do something special with your pets on Sunday. And on Monday, I'll share a few ways to help you to be a better pet parent. Take care and thanks for tuning in.